selective truth. Values for sale? In these challenging times, do we really know what's going on? How are we influenced by the media, politics, and the economy? Join us to discuss media, freedom, values. At the Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum, the place made for minds. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our closing ceremony. Here's your host, Terry Martin. Thank you. Thank you very much. And welcome to the closing ceremony of the Global Media Forum 2016. Um, I hope you're filled up with new ideas, new contacts, new ways of approaching journalism. It's certainly been a, a very stimulating time for me, I've taken advantage of, of the afternoon sessions to, uh, to learn some new things myself. Particularly today, the question of how do you deal with the distinction between objectivity and impartiality? Fascinating question for me, for myself, something I, I, I think it's important that we all reflect on that at a time of increasing polarization. Anyway. Today, for the closing ceremony, we have two speeches. First of all, if you walked here this morning from the bus or train stop, you might have noticed some colorful signs along the way. And these are signs referring to the commitments of different, con different cities around the world who've committed themselves to reducing their carbon footprint. Those signs serve as a kind of marquee for the big white building that you saw rising up behind that. That building is the UN's climate policy headquarters, if you didn't already know that. It's right next door, right between here and Deutsche Welle itself. Now, climate change, like sustainable development, presents journalists with a monumental challenge because climate change is also extremely complex, and it makes it difficult for journalists to report on it accurately and properly. I, I know this from experience too because I've covered a couple of conferences of the parties, the COPs, the UN climate conferences, including the one in Copenhagen, which was quite a challenge. Our next speaker understands perhaps better than anyone else exactly what's at stake in the effort to inform the world about climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, it's our great honor to introduce Christiana Figueres, the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning or good afternoon depending on when your noon starts. Um, quick question, how many of you actually knew that we were neighbors here, that the UN was just right next to you? Oh good, excellent, okay, very, very good. Uh, because you, you, know, you, you never know whether people are actually opening their eyes when they're walking toward uh, lunch or toward, uh, toward work, toward the forum in this case, uh, but, uh, but quite wonderful. And I must say, for the climate uh, convention, and we're not the only ones who are here, there are 18 organizations of the UN who are here in Bonn, and it is quite an honor to be here, not just uh, because it is Bonn, but uh, because we're occupying very historical buildings in the... Uh, in, in the history of Germany, and it's always uh, an honor to, to be able to live and work here. So thank you very much, Deutsche Welle, wo sind Sie? Deutsche Welle, Leute, Brr. hallo, wunderbar, vielen Dank. Vielen Dank für die nette Einladung heute. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation to join you here uh, at the end of your session. Um, and you know, I, I looked quickly through your agenda, and I was quite impressed, uh, because I thought, well, you know, on the one hand, there could be the expectation, just today, there could have been the expectation that uh, you are meant to solve the, the tension between privacy and security, the violence against women and children, the US presidential elections, good luck with that, um, Islam, migration, and I don't know what other topics you've been uh, treated to today. Uh, so, you know, there, there always is, and on the part of us, who use your very valuable services, there always is uh, the thought of, well, you know, if the journalists could just get it right, 
then we would solve X, Y, Z, right? So, um, so let, let me be the first one to say, yes, I always uh, want journalists to get things right, uh, but it is very, very clear that you do not have the power, and nobody does, to, for any very, very uh, magical solutions to these problems. On the other hand, my friends, I would also argue that while you cannot solve these, on the other hand, you also cannot just inform the public about events that occur. If that is what you're doing, then we don't need you as people. Then we just need little iPhones or whatever else people use for videos and recording. Uh, but then we're not using your brain. Then we're not using your heart. Then we're not using your soul. So from my perspective, what I would always want to see in journalists, and I'm told that you're no longer called journalists, you're now called content producers. So let me bring myself up to date with that. Um, but it is that you approach events not just with a reporting to report the news as a news event, but actually, from my perspective, I think uh, that you have an incredible privilege and you stand in a very, very important nexus where you're able to use news events that occur out there but you use them to connect dots. You use them to point out to the general public what are the ramifications of that news event? What does it mean? How, how did we get to that? And what are the implications for the future? So that connecting the dots, seeing the ramifications of news events is where I think that you have extraordinary value added and in fact, uh, I would say very unique uh, position in the global society. So how does that apply to climate change? Because I guess you can figure out that being the executive secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that climate change is sort of what I have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, and that is correct. So you will forgive me if I use climate to exemplify how I think that you have this enormous opportunity and responsibility, frankly, to connect dots for people and to see ramifications. So question number two of the day, how many of you were in Paris? Excuse me, I don't mean having fun in Paris. I mean at COP21, can I actually? How many of you were at COP21 in Paris? Okay, so about six of you. All right, well, um, let me just say, yes, Paris was an event, okay, a news event. Uh, and it was carried certainly at the end uh, on all the front pages of every single, uh, every single newspaper and every single TV show, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was definitely an event. We had, other than the six people here, we had uh, 3,700 journalists who were there, which was actually uh, just uh, two-thirds of the 6,000 who wanted to come. And the reason why Nick Nuttall has you know, lo lost all of his hair here, the head of comms at uh, the Secretariat, is because he had to say no to more than 2,000 journalists who wanted to, uh, to come in. Um, and I will have you remember that COP21 occurred in Paris just two weeks after the attacks in Paris. So the fact that so many people wanted to come uh, is already a news event in itself. We had 28,000 participants from every single country in the world. We had, we opened the conference with 155 heads of state and government, never before in the history of women and mankind had we ever had 155 heads of state and government under one roof on one day for one topic. Because at the United Nations, we bring them together for the General Assembly, but they always come over two to three to four days throughout the, the high-level uh, part of the General Assembly. So 155 uh, heads of state on one day under one roof for one, for one topic. And with one message, we want an ambitious universal climate change agreement. That was quite an opening that we had. Um, and not only that, but we actually opened already with almost 190 national climate change plans coming from 190 countries, which means all of those countries had already done their homework at home to figure out how can they nationally, from their national perspective, contribute to the global effort. So my point number one is, yes, Paris was a news event, and it was reported 
probably more than any other United Nations event. It was reported as such in every single media uh, and was characterized as the huge surprise, unprecedented, historic, never seen before, et cetera, et cetera. All the superlatives that we Latins love, but you know, the Germans tell me are actually not to be used, not that I've ever taken that advice because I continue to speak in superlatives. My point number two is that uh, not only was it a news event, it was a historic news event. And why was it history? Why did it make history? Well, I would argue for at least four reasons. First, how many of you have ever had a little family conversation in which you want to have a unanimous decision about anything, be it what you're going to do on the weekend or what you're going to have for dinner? You know how difficult it is to get a unanimous You, one person, ra one person raised his hand that he's actually has family conversations that end up in a unanimous decision. Congratulations, a very unique family. I don't think that is the experience of most people. But here, what we had was 195 countries who came together to take a unanimous decision. Now, that is a historic event. And not only what is it a unanimous decision, it was a unanimous decision to intentionally change the course of the global economy toward low carbon and high resilience. An amazing, amazing historical event. Second reason why, a global agreement that included everyone. The previous agreement that we had was actually only for some countries, for some industrialized countries. This is a legally binding framework that brings all countries together under the same rules and the same pathway, onto the same pathway. And we started, as third reason, we started with these 190, uh, almost 190 national climate change plans uh, and recognized them as the first step, but certainly not the last. But in the Paris Agreement, this unanimous decision that they have taken, they have actually set out, all the governments of the world have set out the path forward. Now we know what the path is going to look like, not over two or three years, probably over two or three decades, because that is probably going to be the lifespan of, uh, of the Paris Agreement. And finally, why is this a historic event? Because not only does it mark the starting point, not only does it delineate the path that is going to be followed by all the economies of the world, it actually is very clear about what the destination is going to be by the second half of the century, or rather the Paris Agreement, to be very correct, says in the second half of the century, although I like to change that proposition. Uh, but in the second half, or I say by the second half of the century, we have to be at a remarkable point in which we will only be emitting as many greenhouse gas emissions as the planet is capable of absorbing naturally. That balance, that ecological balance is called by some climate neutrality or zero net, but that is the destination that we're all going to. And it's not exactly where we are right now because we are still increasing in our greenhouse gas emissions, but we will have to, in order to stay on the path that has been determined in Paris, we will have to peak very soon and descend our emissions very, very clearly. My point number three, is that uh, Paris, the Paris Agreement, although it was a news event, and although it was a historic event that really marked history, it cannot be allowed to be only an event that marked the beginning of a different history. It has to be an event, and change is always made by events, it has to be an event that charts out a different path of the future history. We have to get on to a path that is dramatically different now than it would have been without the Paris Agreement. And that, my friends, is where you come in because you're probably wondering, and what do I have to do with that? Well, this is where you come in because over the next five, 10, 15 years, we have to be able to communicate in a compelling, coherent fashion that we actually are on that path. So 
Are we? Well, you know, I don't know how many of you speak German, but uh, German has a fantastic word that I wish existed in many other languages, which is jein, which means both yes and no. Very typical attitude of us Latin Americans, uh, although we don't have the word. But uh, are we on the path? Uh, jein is the, is, the, is the answer. So are we on the path on the yes side? Yes, we're definitely moving forward. Uh, yes, we do have 175 countries who have now just not just adopted the agreement, they've actually signed on to it, and 17 of them have actually already made it legally binding in their countries by adopting a, uh, an instrument of ratification. Yes, we're on the path because that very, very quick signing and ratification will potentially mean that this agreement will be legally binding in an international law much quicker than was previously thought. We thought it would come into force in 2020, and given the speed with which this is being actually internalized in all of the countries, it's possible that it may be come into force next year, 2017, or at most 2018, two or three years before it was intended. Are we on the path? Yes. Uh, the United States has already said that they are going to make this legally binding in the United States. India and China will be making it legally binding. China and the United States, by the way, this year, somewhere between August and September. India perhaps uh, early next year, the European Union early next year, et cetera, et cetera. But yes, we are on a path toward make this, making this legally binding. Um, and in the real world, because you could argue, well, okay, that's just the world of the United Nations and legal text, and what does that have to do with the reality? Well, in the real world, we're also moving forward. Uh, the latest fantastic news of our uh, solar impulse, and I hope that you follow that, uh, that news, the airplane that is making its way around the world with a single drop of fossil fuel, only with solar energy, just landed in the United States in, uh, in New York and will be completing its uh, trip around the world when it lands in Dubai uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks from now. Morocco current, I'm just gonna give you a few little examples. Morocco uh, currently boasts the largest concentrated solar power plant in the world, Morocco, okay? This is not Germany, uh, this is Morocco, a truly developing country, boasts the uh, largest uh, concentrated solar power plant in the world with 500 megawatts, and Dubai is currently uh, preparing to build an even larger uh, solar power plant. We have more investment going into renewable energy the world over, including the United States, by the way. We have more renewable energy investments going in, more investment going into renewable energy year by year, now for the third year running, than into fossil fuels. And we have 65 corporations and counting that have already committed to uh, being 100% renewable energy, so 100% clean. And those are not small little corporations. Those are corporations the likes of uh, BMW, Ikea, Coca-Cola, Google, Hewlett Packard, Microsoft, Nike, Philips, uh, Starbucks, Unilever, on and on and on. So a long list of multilateral, uh, multinational corporations that are fully um, apprised of the need for them to role model what the rest of the economy uh, needs to do. So that's the yes part to my question. Are we moving forward? Now, you remember the word yain, which means both yes and no. So are we moving forward in, uh, in the, at the pace that we should? Well, here comes the no. And the no is because uh, we are still going up globally. We're still increasing greenhouse gas emissions. This spring, enjoy the weather but understand what is going on here. This is the warmest spring ever, ever in the history of recorded temperatures, ever. The Great Barrier Reef is bleaching. Uh, we're already losing, we have already lost the first islands that have actually succumbed to increasing sea level rise in the Solomon Islands. Thank heavens those islands were not inhabited, but that will not be the case soon. We will soon lose islands that are inhabited today, and those people will have to migrate. And let's talk about desertification. Let's talk about desertification, another convention that uh, has its headquarters here in Bonn. Today we have 1.5 billion people around the world who are living on degraded land. 1.5 billion people living on degraded land. Europe, just, just to get you know the, the, the relationship of this, uh, last year we had 1.4 million people who came to Europe as migrants, as immigrants. 
1.4 million. I don't need to tell any of you who are uh, in the news or certainly those who are residents in Europe how difficult that has been for Europe to deal with that, uh, with that influx from people who are desperate. Uh, that is 1.4 million. Compare that to 75 million, 75 million people who last year moved, got displaced, migrated internally in the Sahel because of water shortage, food insecurity, loss of livelihood. 75 million still internally in the Sahel, not to be bound by those boundaries. Because my friends, by 2045, if we do not get our act together on the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and on climate change, which are the only two tools that we have to prevent these major disasters, if we do not get our act together on those two, we're gonna have 135 million people who will be migrating because of desertification, because of loss of food security, because of loss of water, because of arable land, and one half of those will be migrating out of Africa, out of Southern and Western um, Africa, onto North Africa and Europe. 62 million people by the year 2045. That is a scenario that we do not want. It is not good for them, it is not good for you. It is not, there is a no win. That is, not, that is a no win, no win, no win scenario. And that is a scenario that we absolutely uh, must, uh, must, must avoid. Um, and my final you know, example, please do not quote me saying that s the situation that we have in Syria is caused by climate change. Please do not quote me by saying that. But I will tell you that the drought, the unusually deep drought that Syria had between the years 2006 and 2010 caused one million farmers in Syria to lose their arable land and move into cities and then see what has happened since 2010. It is not a direct causality, but there is a very strong relationship. And that very strong relationship is one that we're going to be seeing over and over and over again, in particular in the areas that are already vulnerable to uh, to degradation and, uh, and, and very hot uh, and dry weather. So, my friends, what is my uh, request to you? Because you know I'm famous for speaking in public and never letting you go out without asking you for something. So here comes my ask. My ask for you is that uh, as you move forward, you remember that your responsibility is not just to report on events that happen. That can be done by an iPhone. For that, we do not need your brains. For that, I don't need your hearts and your souls. It's not just to report on news events. It's to connect the dots for the public, to look at a news event and go, whoa, 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 hold on. How did we get to this? What, what is the chain? What, you know, go up the valley chain and see how did we get to this point and what, what can we foresee is going to be the implication of this situation if we don't do something differently. What are the ramifications? And you will increasingly see that there is a very, very strong correlation between the lack or the delay in working on climate change, which means bringing emissions down. There is a very strong correlation between that, food insecurity, water insecurity, home insecurity, and then you move on to migration, conflict, wars. Very, very clear. So look at it the opposite way around, okay? The opposite way around. And that is the opportunity that we have as of this year, having adopted sustainable development goals in the United Nations last year, having adopted the Paris Agreement. We, the community of nations, we, the community of people around this world, have a huge opportunity to change that scenario around and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. We are going to do the Sustainable Development Goals. We are going to, uh, to comply with the targets in the Paris Agreement because what that means is we will be restoring lands. We will be increasing food security. We will be increasing water security. We will be increasing home security. We will be planting peace for tomorrow. And that is the scenario that all of us want. Because frankly, if there is one ultimate common interest 
that all humans share, no matter where you were born, no matter what your religion is, no matter what your gender, no matter what your age, we have one common ultimate interest, and that is peace and stability. There is no other more powerful common interest that we all share. And we have the amazing opportunity now to truly take these tools that have been approved unanimously by all the governments with a lot of support from cities, from corporations, uh, and actually make them happen. Because it is the only way that we're going to be able to plant the ground of peace for tomorrow rather than unintentionally perhaps but very cogently, but, but very uh, forcefully walking into more conflict and more wars tomorrow. And from my perspective, but, uh, but that's because uh, that's the world that I live in, uh, I do think that collaborative diplomacy, I, you know, I, I haven't seen a war uh, that finds a uh, solution via military means. I do think that wars, conflicts, and these solutions that we have do require a new form of collaborative diplomacy that was uh, fantastically displayed in Paris, and that is the major miracle of Paris. Uh, and if we did it once, if we did it for the major challenge that the world has ever seen, which is climate change, then my friends, we can do it again. And I count on you to help the world to get to that state. Thanks very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Christiane Figueres, appealing to our conscience as journalists, uh, imploring us to go beyond just reporting and begin to connect the dots perhaps a little more, reminding us all of the security implications of climate change, the security implications of environmental degradation, and reminding us too just how important the Paris Agreement is and the development goals of the United Nations and our, our responsibility in informing the world of what is going on. Thank you so much, Christiana. I want now, we have a little treat for you, a little video treat, uh, just before we have some closing remarks from our Director General uh, at Deutsche Welle. We, if you noticed outside on the left, when you walk out this room on the left, there's this little booth in the corner and it has uh, some arms sticking out of it. It clearly has a, a media freedom uh, theme to it. It's a booth where you can actually walk into it, close the door, and make a statement. And this booth is a project, they're calling it The Booths. Uh, they've been set up in uh, Egypt and in Lebanon and in Dubai. And it's a project for empowering people, for giving them a voice. And it's turned out to be a very successful project in the Arab world. We've taken some snippets, some of the examples of what people have been saying inside of this booth here at the Global Media Forum over the past three days, and provides an, a good snapshot of the mindset of the people who are attending the Global Media Forum, what their concerns are, and what their aspirations are. Let's play it. What's going on? Oh, there's the camera. My name is Benjamin Barke. I am from Germany. I'm Katerina. I'm from Russia. My name is Jeffrey Onyama. I'm the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Nigeria. I am from Kairi. I am a thief. My name is Tonki from Indonesia. Uh, freedom means to me that I can do whatever I want without harming anybody. I want to be a free bird. I want to be a Bahraini Arab free bird. Freedom for me is communication. I think all human beings, even the, uh, the baby in the womb, have uh, a freedom. Freedom for me is to be able to move, to walk, to cycle, to climb. It means to me that I can mind my own business without anyone else interrupting that. As a Palestinian, I need my freedom because it's not easy for me to uh, travel, to go out from Palestine. <laughs> See how the cameras do. <laughs> what? How many cameras are here?
here. <laughs> One. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh, you really want me? If I should, you have to come in here with me to dance. Okay. Yeah. Have I got a story for you, my friend? Freude schöner Götterfunken, Tochter aus Elysium. The baby's on the... Yeah. <laughs> Which one? We have so much in common as human beings. Um, I would even go as far as to say that we are all the same. Yes, I do have a story for you. Fantastic, and it, you can see that it's not just serious stuff too. It also captures some genuine talent. It's my, it's my great privilege to introduce our Director General at Deutsche Welle, Peter Limborg, who has been so, so supportive of what goes on at the Global Media Forum for the values that Deutsche Welle represents, for what the Global Media Forum offers as a forum for journalists and policymakers dealing with issues concerning media and freedom, media press freedom in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, for concluding remarks, I give you our Director General, Peter Limbor. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you very much, Christina Figueres, because uh, you really woke us up with your speech. Thank you very much. Uh, you were saying that we journalists should use our brains, which we at Deutsche Welle try to do, made for minds. And uh, you say that we should connect the dots, which if you have a look at our DW News, you will see in the opening that we are connecting dots. So we're not there yet, but we try. And after listening to you, I can understand why this conference in Paris has been a success. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, who contributed to this Global Media Forum. With your remarks, with your thoughts, with your work, with your money, thank you to the sponsors, thank you to the partners. And thank you very much also for the people who organized all this. And I would like to name Guido Schmitz and Patrick Leusch, who did this. But I also want to name Mr. Nolting and Frau Gröniger, who did this the years before and laid the foundation that this Global Media Forum is a success. And I would like to thank everybody in the team of the Global Media Forum and everybody around, whether it's catering, whether it's whatever it was, whether it's security, they really made this a great success. Thank you very much. I thought we had some inspiring highlights in these past two and a half days. And uh, I'm quite proud that the president of Germany gave us an address where he reminded us how important freedom of speech is. And he also told us that uh, disinformation and instability is something which should be countered by serious journalism. That's what we try here. And that was, I think, all of us could uh, agree upon that uh, serious journalism, good information, and also explaining the world, as Christina Figueres said, is a task we all are united for to work for. And I would like to think of uh, the Freedom of Speech Award, which we had been able to give to Sedat Ergin, the editor-in-chief of Hurriyet, who gave us here, I think, some thrilling moments where we could just feel how it is, how big the pressure is for the moment for journalists in Turkey. And I thank uh, every winner and every participant in the Best of Blog Award, where we were able to, to show people who are very active in online activism and who are trying to make the world better with their projects. And uh, I thank very much Basim Youssef, who came uh, to 
this um, award-winning ceremony and to give his approval to that what the people are doing, fighting for freedom, fighting for human rights and press freedom. I was very happy to see again the ECRO ambassadors, which came from Nigeria, where we have a great cooperation with Channels TV and where we are now able to really do more for the environment with a really co-productive magazine, which now also will be produced not only between Nigeria and Berlin and Bonn, but it also will be uh, produced together with Kenya in the following year. So we had, I think, uh, nice moments, drone flights here. We had uh, great music, culture, and good food. So what do you want to ask more? So I'm really happy that this uh, Global Media Forum was uh, a thrilling time for me, a busy time. I think you all have learned more than I did because I had so many people to meet, so I couldn't really watch all the panels and discussions, which uh, is every year like this. So uh, next year I will try to be, to be better informed about everything what you're doing. And I think what is really important is that we, we didn't only talk about values and looked it up, looked, as, looked at our European values and said, well, we have wonderful, great values. Now, I think we were really into the discussion between others and uh, what brings the world together and talking about our values and saying how valuable they are. We also got the reflection from some of you that we Europeans, and sometimes we Germans, we don't even live after these values or we don't deal with it. So if people of you saying, yes, great Europe, that you have wonderful values, but you're selling arms to dictators, or you're polluting the world, or, for instance, you work together with corrupt regimes. So I think this doesn't diminish our values, but it gives us, I think, a strong reminder to also live after our values and not only preach them. So basically, with this thought, I like to give you a nice trip home. I wish you all well. And uh, I'm very happy to see most of you on the 19th of June, 2017, here in Bonn, back again. Bye-bye. <laughs>